Schomburg Center, to me, it is home. The place where we come to see who we really are, not just somebody else's reflection of who we are. The Schomburg Center is a place of culture, it's a place of history, it's a place of knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is a repository of all of the things that has documented our sense of worth as a people. For me, that means that it is a place of immense power. The Schomburg Center is a public research library and a cultural institution. For the study of the Pan-African world, it is perhaps the best in the world. My Schomburg Center is, I grew up on Sol Schomburg. Arturo Schomburg said, Black history and culture and intellect exist. At a time when most people didn't believe that, we collected those evidences. And that became the beginning of the collection. And it has expanded and has grown to where it is now a world-class institution. It holds over 10 million items. There's no parallel anywhere that brings to light what we as people of color have done, what we continue to do. Black culture is all of culture. The universals that animate everyone's life happen here for all people. The Schomburg for me is one of the center pillars of Harlem. When I started the journey of finding out about Red Rooster and Harlem, the very first place I went to was the Schomburg. Researchers from around the world come and use what we have here. I could not have written just about any of the books that I've written without the Schomburg Center's archives, resources. The Schomburg Center is much more than a library. We encourage lifelong learning and exploration. The Junior Scholars Program is a Saturday program with students from fifth grade to senior year in high school to help them learn about black history and culture. Learning about my history is important because it teaches me who I am. The Schomburg Junior Scholars Program is going to do nothing but uplift me. So many talented and brilliant people have walked the corners of this amazing institution over the years. From Octavia Butler to Toni Morrison and James Baldwin, Ella Fitzgerald, Alvin Ailey, and Harry Belafonte, who graced the stage in this room of the American Negro Theater. This place evokes great memories. It was a gift to us and our communities to really try to find that space to reflect expressions of black experience. I just knew that the environment, what I saw these young African Americans doing, was a place I needed to be. What is my Schomburg Center? I'm standing here at the Cosmogram, which underneath holds the ashes of the poet Langston Hughes. On the evening when this Cosmogram was dedicated, people began to empty out of the auditorium. A jazz trio struck up, and to my amazement, Amira Baraka went over and asked Maya Angelou for a dance. And they started to dance on top of the cosmogram, on top of the ashes of Langston Hughes, and I felt what a fitting way to kiss the memory of Langston. The Schomburg Center is a research institute and a library, but it's so much more than that. There's something going on every day so many amazing people come here to talk about their creative craft, to share what inspires them. The Schomburg Center's collections help to tell stories even beyond our walls. The Schomburg Center is here in this exhibition at MoMA, One Way Ticket, Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series. We depend on the resources of the Schomburg to enable us to tell the story. Thinking about the implications of the past on the present is absolutely crucial for understanding the next steps, understanding what we have to do to go forward. We today have the responsibility of making sure that new artists and activists, new scholars and poets know that this place continues to be a resource and a source of inspiration for the work that we must continue to do. The Schomburg Center is knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is education. The Schomburg Center is home. It is family. It is foundational. The Schomburg Center is inspiration. The Schomburg is with me in everything that I do. Community, inside and out. The Schomburg Center is us. The Schomburg Center is you. And we invite each and every one of you to find your Schomburg Center.
Good evening. I want to welcome you to the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. And of course, this welcome extends to both our audiences here in Harlem and those of you who are joining us virtually. My name is Joy Bivens, and I have the immense pleasure of serving as director of, the, of this historic institution, where every day we celebrate black history and culture. Our collection of 11 million items attest to the lived experiences and creativity of people of African descent across the diaspora. We are a free public research library, and we encourage you to utilize our resources to engage your curiosity about the histories, the cultures, and the stories of black people. You can visit us at schomburg.org to learn more about what we do, to view some of our collections, engage our digital exhibitions, and access information, pardon me, information about our upcoming programs. In a moment, I'll bring my colleague, Novella Ford, Associate Director of Public Programs and Exhibitions to the podium to introduce tonight's program, as well as the guests who will grace our stage this evening. But before I do that, I simply want to share how delighted I am to see each of you and to be able to greet you this evening and share this space with you for this tonight's experience as we celebrate the new book, Sing a, Sing a Black Girl Song, The Unpublished Works of Ntozaki Shange, edited by the one and only Dr. Imani Perry. Dr. Perry will be joined this evening by Ebony Noel Golden, Alana Raquel Bowers, Margaret Odette, and Erica Dickerson Despenza. You are really in for a good time this evening. Now I'd like you to join me in welcoming Novella to the podium to share more information about this evening's program and possibly some information about the rest of our fall season. Thank you for being here and welcome to the Schomburg. Thank you, Joy. Thank you all for being here this evening. As Joy said, welcome to the Schomburg Center. I'm Novella Ford, and I'm the Associate Director of Public Programs and Exhibitions. And tonight, we have a wonderful program planned in honor of Ntisake Shange and the publication of Sing a Black Girl's Song, The Unpublished Works, a new posthumous collection of Shange's unpublished poems, essays, and plays edited by Imani Perry. The program will include readings by Dr. Perry, who will also tell us a bit about how this collection came to be, theatrical ceremonialist and cultural strategist Ebony Noel Golden, actors Alana Raquel Bowers and Margaret Odette, and poet playwright Erica Dickerson Despenza. We will tell you more about each of these people as we go throughout the evening, but hopefully you got sort of one of these programs that tell you a little bit about how this evening's program will go. Also, if you've already purchased the book from the Schomburg shop, you can also find these um, works that they will be reading from uh, in the book, and you can also read along as you go. Following their readings, there will also be a conversation. So tonight, as we always try to do, is chock full of information, chock full of archives, of course, historical record, but also a very, very good time, and you all are part of that good time, so thank you for being here tonight. We hope tonight is just one of the many programs you'll attend over the course of the season. The season showcases the breadth of scholarship and creativity, helping to expand our understanding of historical figures like Bayon Rustin and Willie Mae Thornton, the archives, of course, and ideas about incarceration, education reform, and more that's influencing contemporary society. So the ways you can find out about these programs, well, of course, coming here tonight, I'm telling you that we have programs coming up. But also, there is a rack card uh, available right outside of the doors when you walk inside um, of the auditorium that gives you a sense of what's coming up for the rest of September, which includes a conversation about Bayon Rustin and a new autobiography that has been written, as well as uh, a fantastic conversation, a conversation I've been hoping uh, to pull together, and we have called The Poetics of the Archive, and it includes um, poet Nikki Finney, as well as Robin Costa Lewis, talking about their latest collections um, that feature their own personal archive alongside their poetry. Uh, and they will be in conversation with Jacqueline Woodson, 
Again, I mentioned Willie Mae Thornton. We have DJ Lene Denise coming from all across the diaspora. She's originally from California. She also includes Amsterdam and London and anywhere in the diaspora that calls her home, she calls home as well. Alongside Saul Williams and um, Tamara Kali and many others. And then there's also a calendar for the season. And so on the cover, you'll see a cassette tape similar to the uh, slides that you saw earlier, as well as Wild Style. Those are items that are in our collection from the Fab Five Freddy archives that we received. So we're also still celebrating the 50th anniversary of hip hop, but also pulling from the archives and thinking about hip hop as a mixtape, and that's how we're thinking about our season. So you can also pick up that calendar outside that will tell you a little bit more about our programs. But of course, visit us on our website at schomburg.org. You can also find programs as they become listed to register on Eventbrite, as many of you all have done this evening. There are many ways to support the work of the Schomburg Center. Shout out to all of our Schomburg Society members. Any Schomburg Society members in the house? Thank you, thank you, thank you. You all already got the best deal in the house. You get a discount in the Schomburg shop. The rest of you all know when you go in the Schomburg shop, there's always more than one thing that you want. So why not go ahead and get a discount on that? So please think of the ways of, that you can support the Schomburg. Of course, your attendance is first and foremost, um, but they're also through your financial support. We are able to continue the work of offering free programs all through the year, through, all throughout the year because Black History Month is every month here at the Schomburg Center. So give yourselves a round of applause first for being here. So tonight's title may be very familiar to many of you. This excerpt uh, comes from, uh, gives us the, the, the title. Somebody, anybody, sing a black girl song. Bring her out to know herself, to know you. But sing her rhythms, Karen, struggle, hard times. Sing her song for life. That was an excerpt from For Colored Girls Who Have Considered Suicide When the Rainbow Is Enough. The 1974 Choreo poem that retains its status as the longest running play by an African American writer in Broadway history. Yes, and Sasaki Shange is still making history. Also, before I forget, I want to say hello to any of her family members that are in the audience that were attending. Thank you. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you all for joining us. Absolutely. I feel fortunate that we were able to bring together this constellation of women whose contributions to the arts and letters propel our culture forward in ways that we will talk about long into the future. But I also wanted to make mention of another time that we celebrated in Sasaki Shange here, and that was in 2014. I was only an avid visitor to the Schomburg Center, and Silvio, the curator, if you know him, he is in all of his flamboyance and eccentric and style and color, uh, curated this incredible exhibition titled, I Found God in Myself. And it was across three institutions, explored by 47 visual artists in three galleries. And it was a celebration of Shange's legacy. Here at the Schomburg, there were 20 specially commissioned pieces, taking inspiration from her poems, Shange's archives, as well as spirit. We also have incredible photographs of Ntsasake while she was here on our stage and while she was here visiting that exhibition. So the archives are an incredible place because while you get to experience them, yes, they are, Erica, thank you. While you get to experience them sometimes in person, please remember to visit us at any given time, make an appointment, and see what else we have in the archives or revisit programs that have been here. This is why we record our programs and we try to make them available to the public immediately thereafter. There is always something good going on here at the Schomburg Center. As you all know, Shange authored 36 published works is and is increasingly recognized as one of America's greatest writers having over 50 years embodied the struggle of women of color for equality and the recognition of their contribution to human culture. Shange's literary legacy preserved in the Shange Institute at Bernard College comprises 13 plays, seven novels, six children's books, and 19 poetry collections, the majority of which are published and in print. Take this time to silence your cell phone so we can get into this program. Our first two um, readers up will be Imani Perry, who I mentioned is the editor of tonight's collection, and she is the Carol K. Fortsheimer. 
Fortzheimer Professor at Harvard Radcliffe Institute and Professor of African American Studies and Women and Gender Studies at Harvard University. She is the author of seven books, including South to America, winner of the 2022 National Book Award. She is the recipient of the Lambda Literary Award and the Hurston Wright Award, as well as a finalist for the NAACP Image Award, among many others. She has written for the New York Times, The Atlantic, Harper's Ohm, The Paris Review, and many others. She earned her PhD in American Studies from Harvard University, a JD from Harvard Law School, a LLM from Georgetown University Law Center, and a BA from Yale College in Literature and American Studies. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Following her reading, we will hear from Ebony Noel Golden, who is a theatrical ceremonialist, cultural strategist, entrepreneur, and public scholar. In 2009, Ebony founded Betty's Daughter, Art, Betty's Daughter Arts Collective, a, cultural, a culture consultancy that devises systems, strategies, and social justice solutions nationally. In 2020, she founded Jupiter Performance Studio, a space to study and practice black diasporic performance traditions. Winner of the Association for Theater and Higher Education's Transformational Practice Award, Golden works to incite and ignite a creative capacity of everyday folks in service of liberation and collective well-being. Her practice is rooted in community design, ritual performance, which I've had the pleasure of seeing here in Harlem, and leadership development through a womanist and black feminist practice, invoking messy, magical, and medicinal processes. Ebony and her collaborators work to conjure a better world. Please welcome Dr. Imani Perry and following her, Ebony Noel Golden. So delighted to be here this evening. Before I begin, I do want to say just a few words before I do some reading. Um, first, to uh, it's important to thank the Legacy Lit community for the publication, particularly Christiane Trotman, Amanda Ero, and Maya Kennedy. Of course, Donald Sutton of Intazake Shange Estate my dear friend, Tarana Burke, who wrote the foreword and whose birthday was on the day of the book release, uh, the staff of Barnard College Archives, and of course, the Schomburg, the institutional keepers of our legacy. This is a precious place. And more than anyone, without question, our gratitude is owed to ancestor Ntozake Shange, who left us with so much abundance. This morning, I was in my birthplace of Birmingham, Alabama. It's actually the place I first met Tarana. And it was hard to leave. Um, this is a weekend that, that I and, and the folks who are in Birmingham is, were spending commemorating um, the 60th anniversary of the 16th Baptist Church bombing in which four girls were killed and its aftermath in which two boys were also killed. But I thought if I had to leave home, what better place to come than Harlem, where Shange was nurtured as a young writer, and who better to channel and, and honor the lives of black girls and our resilient and resplendent traditions other than scholar, intellectual, dancer, artist, writer, and Tazake Shange. So I'm going to read briefly from an early section of the collection in which she reflected on her mother, um, in part because my mother is the person who introduced me first to Shange's words through her, very, through her voice. And it's also a reminder that though she was a person who was on the vanguard in so many ways, Shange was also someone who was always honoring tradition and legacy. Ellie, who is my mother, too. Once we all wore the same color blue dresses, my sisters, my mother, and I. We were one for a long time. I could not tell long after I should have known better that I was not my mother. I wanted to be my mother. I liked her. 
and liked the way people liked her. I liked my father, but I could not be him. I could be her. I could deep sea fish, play baccarat, sing like Marian Anderson, defend the race. We were a vulnerable people. I could tell from the stories my mother told with her friends when they played inscrutable games of cards for hours. Bridge. What did I know then about my mother? This bridge called my back. What do I know now about my mother? I live with the myth of her, my indisputable legend of her executing intricate steps of the cha-cha-cha in La Habana, dressing us all for the march on Washington, surviving disastrous lover after lover that I chose for myself since I was not my mother. Since I was not my mother, I am still learning to mother myself, which Alta and Adrian told me years ago, but I couldn't give up the black and white films of Ellie, who was my mother, to another time or other places. I see horizons sometimes and think of what she saw for me. I am guilty of spending days under huge oaks imagining myself as my mother when I became a mother, yet I am not. I really know I am not my mother, but if I were to ever lose my myth of this woman of independent thought and chutzpah during the 50s who actually demonstrated the meaning of each one teach one, I would be less a woman than I am, less a mother than I am becoming. I respect Ellie. Then sometimes I feel sadly for her because as colorful and colored as we were, our world was defined in black and white. Our world was featured in ebony, jet, sepia. Now when I look at us, Ellie, and then me and my daughter, something is awry. I become uncollected. I never saw my mother uncollected. She was not one to accept or expect to survive on Blanche's risky kindness of strangers, nor was she invisible but I'm saving all my images, all the touch recollections I can sustain because the depth of Ellie's presence in me is antediluvian, fierce, and infinite, so unlike what she appears to be, all of which she gave to me. everyone. I'm so glad to be here coming to you from a couple blocks away. I live here in Harlem. One of those blessed folks that gets to live in Harlem. <laughs> My people are from Texas and Louisiana and Houston and Marshall and Shreveport and around them parts. I really appreciate how uh, the legacy that Shange leaves us has taught me how to write geography how to write about the land and about how we experience life through what's growing and what's, um, what's changing, yeah? Internally and externally. I have two pieces that I'll be sharing with you um, this evening. And these are, this first one is really uh, reminding me of the choreo poetic, the the ritual that comes through, the song that comes through in Sean Gay's work. It's called uh, Black Folks, It's This Thing Called Love. Sister say sister, I ain't digging your poetry. I ain't digging it no kind of way, you ain't political. A non-political academic poet is what you are, and we ain't got no time, no time for that. You don't mention bloodshed, bullets, blood and killing. Now, sister, you ain't into the truth that we gonna have to fight and some of us die for the rest. Sister, you non-political and you wasting time. Wait up, now wait up. I ain't gonna talk to my folks about dying or blood or bullets cause we know about death. 
Hey, we die every morning when we open our eyes. Toss flimsy blankets off a lumpy bed, leave cold running quickie showers, dirty imitations of life. We die every time a nigga beats his woman till she can't stand no more. Every time one of us forgets infants on prickly horse tracks. No, no. I don't have to talk to my folks about dying. We know about death. I want to talk about sons we ain't never seen except through sweat dripping, dripping across our eyes and evenings with your man when you know he's happy because you just alive. Yeah. I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about that. Ain't felt because we too busy hustling dead. Yeah, black folks know about death every day, annihilation, cutting us off from each other, making black women bitches and men motherfuckers, having invisible hemorrhages and no Medicaid available. <coughs> no. Don't raise, your, don't raise your voice about being non-political. I heard, Felipe, you got to smell the shoe leather before you know the man's got his feet, both feet up your ass. I heard, Jeruba, niggas singing, finger popping while the man is getting ovens ready. I heard, Stokely, move over or we'll move over you. And I answered. I shouted, I raised my hand when Imamu cried, will the machine gunners please step forward? I'ma be there, I'ma I'm a be there. I'm here with you now, but you gotta talk to my folks about living. I gotta talk to them about loving each other so they'll know they precious. That they everything and that our lives are all together. Because we all here with each other. Don't call me non-political just because I want my folks to understand. To understand that them Carolinian razors, them Carolinian shave and, and a haircut razors ain't meant for our veins. Lion, poison, lion, smack, that ain't for us. I want them to feel that black love holding on, protecting us, guiding us whenever we lost. I want my folks to see themselves, to look, damn it, and say, all what I forgot for my sisters, all what I got for my sisters, all what I got for my brothers is everything I love. Now, I ain't going to talk no bloodshed, no bullets and killing. I'm going to talk about black love. That's what the revolution is about. Revolution ain't about bloodshed or death. The revolution is about our lives. The sun's horizons we gonna see, the folks we gonna have chance to love, yeah! The revolution is about being torn every time, the revolution is about being torn every time a brother puts a sister on the streets, high-stepping for smack for a dose, ah, penicillin! Being wrenched every time a blood decorates his black soul with hypodermic rifts beneath echoes of broken days. Being sick, I tell you, sick when every ain't any black child is cold, hungry, and unloved. I'm going to keep writing. I'm going to keep writing, keep on talking about black love and black beauty. Because revolutionaries don't grow on trees, my man. Revolutionaries grow from pain and hurt, from anguish. What you black folks, our folks dying, watching black folks, our folks dying. Revolutionaries grow or made spring up from the caring so bad and loving so much. I am recruiting. I'm recruiting me some machine gunners, some bombardiers, some riflemen every time I cry. Black folk, I love you and you killing me when you kill yourself. I'm making me some revolutionaries every time I say, I love you black nappy-headed nappy bastards. 
I love you. You wait. You wait. You wait and you watch how many pick up the gun, how many lay down their lives and de destroy this thing with this dumbass foot around our throat. The revolution ain't coming till we love each other. Amen. We gonna have to believe to pray like we ain't never prayed for a black thing, a beauty, black beauty to grab us tight and strangle our resistance to black life. Pray for a black love. Black love to set us straight. And we won't miss a target. Won't miss, because we love black folks too much to be making errors. Yeah. We going to be so careful with ourselves. Powerful. Ain't no which way about it. We got the power, and the power is blackness. When you gonna get them M14s? When you gonna get them M14s? I tell you, I gotta know black folks, cause I don't, I don't wanna, can't go nowhere without you. I gotta know, cause I love you and love you, black folks. I love you. Shonda. One more, written by Ntozaki in 1971, summer of 1971. It's for Leon uh, Damas, a banjo. I am strange rhythms, life tones vibrating. My fingertips are music makers. I am song. I sing infants torn from suckling nipples, okra and rice, high top sneakers, blonde wigged ladies prancing, nappy head women walking. I am three braids that swell up by midday. I am dust. My grandfather's soil, rice before we eat, last sacraments for lynch to Geechee's far off cousins in Oklahoma territory. Dirt farmers, Indian fighters in blood-dusted uniforms. I am that blood, wrenching me from my earth, my soil, leaving me bloody in front of my sisters who scalps somebody close, hung round his waist for luck. I am the screaming blood of rape, incest child. I am sorrow's wailing mother. I am songs are blood songs. I am little Sally Walker shaking to the left and shaking to the right, shaking to the one that ran off the plantation one starry night, slept with swamp creatures, went off to San Quentin silent and bitter, nods death like on Alvarado Street, denies me from the front seat of a velvet green El Capagero, I am fear. I am warnings of night riders, tar and syrup guineas and Polacks with chains in Little Italy. I am a steel pipe, a zip gun. I am cotton picked in harsh sunlight, a chain gang, a shack, a sparse garden. I am Hoppin' John and Greens. I am strange rhythm. I am drums at East Village sets, Jesus banging on the doors of the apostolic church. I am the sound of clandestine meetings, invocations of spirits with no names. I am Deacon Jones and the Sunday picnic. I am a red bandana. I'm broken bottles and sulfur fumes. I am the James Brown. I am the James Brown. I am Throbbing. I am grits and potted meat. I am dance, ring shouts, and sunrise shakers touched by the Holy Ghost trucking down 8th Avenue. I am a Harlem record store twitching all night long. I am Creole gumbo, soft shell clams, and hot sauce. I am 
blues. I am a banjo picking dawn from out of nowhere. I'm a nightmare. I'm a dream. I'm russet, the Mississippi Delta. I am three tricks a night. I am strange rhythms. A Geechee twice removed from Charleston's home. I'm a banjo, an African music maker. My strings are your strings, your blood, my blood. Songs, dances, fears, loves are my morning call. I am corn rolls, gelles, and kalimbas. I am yams and butter. I am a family of 16 caught in the projects. I am strange rhythms. I am a sparrow, my song makes the wind move. I ease your restless sleep, I cause the lizard's teeth to protect you from inside torture. I am Cairo and Cass St. Louis, I'm four for a dollar. I'm cleaning chitlins in July. I'm a banjo picker, passing your windows and your doors. Yesterday heaped up on my shoulders, tomorrow jumping from my eyes. This moment gyrates through my fingertips. I am strange rhythms. I cakewalk through crashing glass and riotous streets, singing my always song of truth, strange rhythms of dirt and laughter. I am Sapphire's second cousin. I live only when I hear me. I am our secret of curried goat and red rice. I'm a high tail jig from everywhere. I strike black notes too intimately mingle our blood. I slash the overseer's wrists. My songs are blood songs. Zaki Shange, Paulette Williams, 7, 16, 71. Thank you. That was Ebony Noel Golden. Let's give her another round of applause. Next, we have two incredible actors who I've seen. One I thought more recently, which is Margaret Odette, who appeared in public theater Shakespeare in the Park production of Much Ado About Nothing, but that was in 2018, and it was directed by Tony Award winner Ke uh, Kenny Leon. It's available on PBS, so I highly recommend uh, seeing a screening of that. But they are doing two, uh, one of Shange's uh, short plays that appear in the collection. And I'll read a little bit about um, what Imani wrote in the book. Although Shange's posts for Colored Girls publications were overwhelmingly poetry and fiction, she continued to write plays and experiment with a combination of theater and performance poetry. Included here are five plays of Shange's, the one act, Mother Courage, and Yvette, and Daddy Says, which is the tender, grief-soaked conversation between two girls whose mother has died. The play that they will be reading from is Daddy Says. I'll tell you a little bit now about each of them. The roles of the daughters will be played by Alana Raquel Bowers, as well as Margaret Odette. They will also switch off the role of the father. Alana Raquel Bowers is an actor, dancer, and singer born and raised in Baltimore. She's a proud alumna of the Baltimore School of the Arts and NYU Tisch Drama. She recently made her Broadway debut in Chicken and Biscuits, originating her role as Simone at Circle in the Square Theater. Regional and credits include Scraps at the Flea Theater and Chicken and Biscuits at Queens Theater. Off-Broadway credits include Bernada's Daughters at the Signature Theater, which is what I saw her in recently, and hope to work with each and every one of the actresses who were part of that particular show, so I'm glad that she can join us tonight. She was also in What to Send Up When It Goes Down at ART New York Theater, 
Woolly Mammoth Theater Company, American Repertory Theater, The Public Theater, and BAM, respectively. She has been featured in numerous readings and developmental workshops at notable institutions, including the Public Theater, Playwright Horizons, and many others. Her film and TV credits include After Class, starting, starring Justin Long, season one of FBI's Most Wanted on CBS, and season two of Dr. Death, starring Mandy Moore, airing soon on Peacock. Margaret Odette, as I mentioned, had appeared in the 2019 Public Theater Shakespeare in the Park production of Much Ado About Nothing. She has also appeared in The Convent uh, at Rattlestick Playwrights Theater Arts in New York. She Kills Monsters at the Flea Theater, Vampire and Vampire Cowboys, uh, Figaro at the Pearl, along with other plays. Regionally, she's appeared in Paradise Blue at the Long Wharf Theater, Taming of the Shrew, and the Vibrator play at Ch Chautauqua. Chautauqua. Margaret stars in the TV series Sex Life on Netflix. She has many, many other television credits as well as film credits, but also she is a research assistant here in our Scholars in Residence program, so it's always exciting to see the other lives of people who work here at the Schomburg Center. She has a BA from Brown University and an MFA from NYU Tisch graduate acting. Please welcome Alana and Margaret as they read from Daddy Says, a play. Daddy Says, a play. The scene opens with two girls, Lucy Marie and Annie Sharon, practicing rope tricks and tie-down roping in their bedroom, which is decorated with rodeo and riding paraphernalia. There are lots of portraits of their mother in riding gear and rows of trophy belts that she won covering the walls. There is a large bed, a window, and a saddle on a sore horse. The doorway opens to a stairway, which leads to the kitchen, which is also the living room. It should be adequate, but a little worn. Ain't that the way to do it? Well, I taught you, so you ought to know what you're doing by now. Mama showed you everything you think you know and every single thing you call yourself teaching me, so there. You know I don't like disgusting mama, so cut it out, you hear? This being the day she died and all. By the time she was your age, she was already a champion. What you call yourself, since you learned how to walk, talk, crawl, and rope all single-handed like a newborn heifer or something? I call myself me, okay? Besides, I am a champion. No, you ain't. You just one of them first prize winners. Being a champion means you win everything there is to win. More than a few times, like, season after season and year after year, like mama. Tawanda Rochelle Johnson, that's my mama's name. Was your mama's name. Yeah. You write about mama. You know what Lincoln Maceo told me? No. He say that he gets up in there and you get a baby. No lie! Mm-hmm. But if it's wiggly and squiggly looking, you know, like Mavis' little boy, mm-hmm. Oh, cush and curled up. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, how could it get up anywhere? Mother dear say, it don't matter how, it ain't supposed to get in nowhere. Ugh. Size, where all it gonna go? Or are you fixing to tell me, let me in on that? Up in here somewhere. See, it has to be this big. No. <laughs> that can't be. Don't nobody want nothing that big up in there? Well, I don't get how that's gonna happen. We just said whatever. Them little dicks is they still little old squiggly wiggly thing. <laughs> Look like covered up snakes. <laughs> <laughs> but they's the old kind of snakes. Ooh, like diamondbacks, right? Yeah, leave him out of this. He don't talk to me about stuff like this. Yeah, but mama would have told us, huh? What you think? What you mean? Don't talk about mama. I don't want to talk about her. 
feet, you just can't remember the way I do. But Annie Sharon, I don't want to talk about her. You think she rides with us when we race? <laughs> Annie takes one of Mama's prize belts and wraps it around herself. You know, Daddy don't like that talk like that. He say, let the dead rest, he say. I know what he say. I don't know what make me think something simple-minded like that. See, it's only Mama could tell us all we need to know so we could Oh, be beautiful. You know, like Linda Beauville or Tussie Woo Mamas do their hair up with them perms and stuff. Put that no chipping polish on their nails, fringes on their rodeo get ups, you know. Make pies and do for what they do for entertaining. That's what they mamas do. That's what our mama would have been doing too. Well, we ain't got one. Annie throws the belt across the room. You can't do that. Look what you did to Mama's prize. It ain't nothing but a damn piece of rawhide with some silver on it. That ain't your mama, fool. That a symbol. That's how she died. That's how come she died. Bronk buster. Everybody in the world know can't no woman in her right mind be no bronk buster. Oh, no, but not your growed up mama. She gonna show the world what all she could do. She the Virgin Mary in a cowboy hat. Can't no wild thing but she dead. Trample for her living. Trample to death like so much hog feed. Trying to prove she more powerful than a stallion. That's your precious mama. Who's gonna tell you how to be a woman? Tell you what you need to know. Like she could grow nails on a cowgirl's hand. All you need to know, that's some dreams you got. Don't you talk like that. You take all them things back, Heifer. Mama was wonderful. Don't you go say no more mean things about my mother. I ain't say nothing, but you ain't got one. You ain't got no mother more than I do. You care more about them damn animals than us. Stop it! I'm telling you, she was a great bronc buster. Daddy say bronc busting ain't ladylike. What he know about it? He a big old man. You think she knew something about it? Huh? Don't say nothing else about mommy. Don't. Don't. Their daddy enters. What's that in your hands? I told you, let's what pass be passed. If I said it once, I said it 10 hundred times, and today of all days. But Daddy, we was just looking. You don't look with your hands. Daddy, please, just this one time, tell us something about Mama. She died from bronco busting, trying to be more than a man than a man. That's all. Now put these things back and stop all this noise of all the damn days to ride. Daddy, please, listen to me. Daddy, did you love her? What was she like when she was acting like a girl? Daddy, not when she acted like a boy. What was she like? Daddy, I gotta know. I gotta know something. Something size she died. Daddy, did you think she was pretty? You used to say I look like her. Do you think I'm pretty, Daddy? Please, please tell me. Leave them alone, Lucy. Leave everybody alone, you hear? Yeah. Listen to your sister. What's in the past is in the past. But I look like her and I ain't in the past, Daddy. Please, Daddy, please. I wanted to, I want to be just like her and, oh, I don't know. Lucy, why are you talking all this mess? Can't you see Daddy ain't up to this? Why you got to put us through all this, huh? You shut up. I'm talking to my father. And he ain't mine too? I ain't got no mama either. But you going to ruin my daddy's life talking about how you going to just be like her. Look what she did to daddy. He can't hardly talk about nothing when something brings her to mind. You want to take my daddy away too. You actually more dumb than I thought you was. I ain't dumb. I just want to hear some more about mommy. I got her right. I'm her girl. And what you think I am, some kind of she-goat? Lucy Marie? 
Annie Sharon. Hush all is quarreling. Stop now. I guess, I guess I ain't been handling things like I oughta. He takes two belts from the wall, wraps one around each child. See, <laughs> your mama and me, well, we was just kids. <laughs> she was the prettiest little old thing. <laughs> look just like you. See, I told you, I look just like her. Most times in the summer, when the sun would get to setting, wild like all red and orange with magnolias and Cypress reaching up through them clouds that be hanging from the sky like cotton candy in the grass, smelling ripe like mm. times like that. <laughs> Your mama and me, we jump on Messiah. That's that mayor Tawanda set so much store by. We climb up on Messiah and walk her through them woods past the corral, walk her real slow till we could hear most everything there was to hear. <laughs> and then she, Tawanda, would sing to me. Some old something she made up in her head, just sang to me. <laughs> then all of a sudden, she'd kick up, and off we went, ducking branches, jumping fences. Damn fool gal, most run us into off the wet when we was ducking branches, jumping fences. Damn fool gal. Must run us into a swamp. <laughs> Lord, I'll never forget. <laughs> Fearing Messiah was falling, I was falling. Tawanda was leaning here and then this away, and here come the mud up my pants leg, and I couldn't tell if your mama was under the horse or down in there, something to death in the mud. <laughs> oh, good Jesus. That woman didn't have no kind of sense. <laughs> Just the singing. Just a singing. And here we going, right down off of this animal into the center of the earth. <laughs> that was something. I'm telling you, her cheekbones come way up like Cherokee, real high and glowing brown. But, but ain't no way to get around it. Both of you favor her. From time to time, always on this day. How, Daddy? Right there, by your eyes, I reckon. <laughs> oh, Annie. But Lucy Marie's carrying your mother's mouth. Yep. Y'all is to Wanda's daughters, that's for <laughs> sure. Daddy's rough, tough, riding cutie pies, right? End of play. <laughs> Untitled number 11. My father always said that a sense of humor was absolutely necessary to stay alive in this hard, hard world. And I I've been laughing ever since I grew up. up. <laughs> That's all. That's it. <laughs> Amazing. Let's give them another round of applause. This last reading uh, takes um, its words from some of her writings, uh, maybe journal entries related to her mental health, her time with a therapist, uh, as well as another poem. I love that we get to see all of these different sides of and Tosake Shange and the way that she was writing about all kinds of issues, all kinds of relationships. 
Uh, and we have Erica Dickerson Despenza, who is a New Orleans-based black radical leftist poet, playwright, and womanist cultural memory worker. I love when people put in their bios things that they'll say with their chest, right? Black <laughs> radical leftist poet, playwright, and womanist cultural memory worker, right on. Uh, Afro-surrealism, magical realism, narrative, re-memory, kinesthetics, imagination, kinesthetic imagination, and black queer women's interiority, interiority and erotic fugitivity are conceptual preoccupations of her work. Erica's primary thematic foci are black land legacies, black apocalyptic ritual, environmental racism. Her work occupies sites of intimate reckoning, situating rupture in traditionally sacred or safe spaces, safe spaces to make invisible systems of environmental oppression and cultural trauma visible and ultimately asks us to consider abolitionist political ecologies. She is the public theater's first ever in Sasake Shange social justice theater playwright in residence. Yes, give that a round of applause. She created that role. She also has a, fel um, a fellowship that she established in honor of her literary mother. Awards include Penn Laura Pell um, International Foundation for Theater Award in 2023, Susan Smith Blackburn Prize in 2021, Lawrence and uh, Lawrence Hatcher Foundation Award, Tom Thomas Award, Lily Award, Barry and Bernice, Bernice Stavis Award, along with many others. So please welcome Erica Dickerson, Dis uh, Dickerson Dispenza as she reads these last sets of work. And following her reading, she will be joined by Imani Perry and Ebony Noel Golden for a conversation. <laughs> I want to invite you all to take a breath with me. Um, and in this breath, I want you to inhale all of what Zaki has taught you and exhale all of which you will pass down. So plant your feet. Let's inhale together and exhale. I'm going to start with. Um, this poem that I love. And I miss Zaki every day, the person and the writer. And there are many things that tether me to her, one of which is that we are both daughters of Oshun. And so this poem is called Oshun's Daughter. I come to you in feathered gowns and answered questions. You cannot ask. I dance cross candlelit skies, singing low like Celia Cruz. Round drums, swaying in spangles. I am the carnival queen. Ma Rainey swinging low, seeking dawn, wishing you life. Oshun's daughter grows red. She grows mute in the wickedness of the subway, strangles in her own cries, razors in your face, shots blazing in darkness. Won't you share your breath with me? Breathe my ancientness toward your soul and swoon in my heat. Oshun is golden laden with the scent of wild flowers. She knows the ways of men can taste the blood in your fury. Carry my anger with you. Take this burning up inside me. Bring us triumphant out of this. Glistening with the upside down skulls, arms hanging jagged with buckshot. Won't you share your battles? Let me, let me free. My time knows no end. Eternally, I am beauty, birth of new poets, warriors, ruddy-fingered farmers, makers of gold cloth, well in my loins. Infinitely, I am yellow heavens and blue echoes. Won't you listen? Won't you listen to my song Fontella sings? Bring it to me. Bring it to me. 
bring it to me. Shango fought in a man's frame like you, anxious for, to make a home, a land, one child, like Shango's bold, a child of the sunfire, and flowers jeweled round in the soil, build me a home, somewhere to go. I am Oshun's daughter. I need a place to create, to make beautiful your life a place to sigh, love family, and dance the dance of the cosmos, rejoicing for the righteous have inherited the earth. Zaki, April 24th, 1972. <laughs> Dark Rooms. The following short essays describe Shange's experience with psychoanalysis. After the success of For Colored Girls, she struggled with bipolar disorder, depression, anxiety, and drug addiction. These are things we don't often like to talk about in the black community, but she was gracious enough to share her journey with us. Her mental health challenges continued for decades and she was remarkably open about them and diligent in seeking help through psychoanalysis and tradition, traditional talk therapy. Characteristically, Shange's complicated emotional landscape is rendered with tenderness and beauty, which is particularly important given our collective recognition of the importance of mental health care. In this too, Shange was ahead of her time. The Dark Room. When For Colored Girls was at the height of its controversy slash popularity, I found myself wearing very dark glasses and large hats so that folks wouldn't recognize me. I couldn't ride elevators up or down. If someone figured out who I was, I calmly stated that I was frequently mistaken for her. I'd had other occasions in my life when I was the only African American in a class or banished to the countryside that my family loved so much when I'd been known to dissociate to refer to myself in the third person. Then I was Paulette. Now, in Tazake, repeating the patterns of the girl I'd gleefully left behind. This was very troubling. I'd just become who I was and was in the frenzied act of disappearing me. Now, I confess to discovering many many roads to oblivion, but I rarely recounted these episodes with warmth or a sense of well-being. So I did what I thought troubled writers did. I went to my producer, Joseph Pat, to seek counsel. To my alarm, Joe recommended against analysis or other therapies, because then my writers can't write anymore. Well, writing I was. Living I was, living I was not. Even though I wasn't always a strong supporter of my own perceptions. The ability to write in isolation for hours about anything and enjoy it is a gift, but it is not life. Even I knew this. I could not hide in a dance studio either. My presence was unavoidable, yet unbearable. Off to find a shrink, I went. I was looking for a wizard, some magic, some chant or breath that might make being me something look, to look forward to in the morning. I had the capacity to sleep for four days at a time, if I am so inclined. At one point, I refused to get up and live my life among the living because my dream life was so much more interesting. Wizards I did not find. I did find that finding the right shrink for analysis or analyst is an important decision as finding a soulmate. Anyway, to make a long story less long, I've been involved with over seven mental health care workers in the last 20 years. The overwhelming period of time spent with three, one psychiatrist and two analysts. I lost one analyst to the emergency room, which he saw as a challenge. 
four years of quasi-sane mourning passed before I was able to seek out another with whom I have been working for nearly a decade. The angriest patient. With his help and astounding patience, I have lost my title as the angriest patient ever encountered during all my years of practice to become the 1991 to 1993 heavyweight poetry champion of the world. As you see, a much healthier management of violent proclivities. In all seriousness, I've learned to feel what I see. What I've been blessed to conjure in words is no longer two steps removed. My body is not a hindrance to my spirit, but a manifestation of it. I am still crazy, but not so afraid with that part of me. I can even tell jokes to my crazy person and realize that to be one of my saner moments. I've dressed up as a guinea girl, the ones who stole all the basketball players at my school just to prove that I could be one. There was a, that was a session to remember. I felt when I swear to be electricity in my body. I've known the ocean and intense heat. All this actually while on the couch. Talk about terrified. Try to be the Atlantic Ocean all by yourself in an eight by 12 room with ancient fertility statues placed like Sorry. Try being the Atlantic Ocean all by yourself in an eight by 12 room with ancient fer fertility statues placed like buoys on what I guess I took to be signs of land ahead. I don't know to this day. I've talked in tongues. I've only been able to do some sessions in Spanish or a mixture of French and Portuguese. I don't know why. I know that it's all that would come out. Sometimes I sleep, other times Paulette speaks. Her voice is different from mine, Izaki. Sometimes I wanna knock her out. But since we can only use language as a tool or weapon or doll or whatever I need, I learned at least to talk to her. If I am not wildly gesticulating in some recollection of a dream, legs flying, arms of a flamingo dancer, long Balanchian necklace I could never actualize outside my dark room, where things, me, memories, float out of syllables and become benign or empowering, as they must because they are never without meaning. Joe, my art daddy, as I called him, was wrong about one thing, not many, but one. Psychoanalysis has made me a finer writer, a fuller person, and a funnier one, to be sure. I found characters I would literally shun to be beauteous. I've been able to take on the persona of someone puzzling to me with no need, not a desperate one, to figure her out. I am, have, am, plumbing the primordial depths of me. Not without trepidation, but with a magic I thought I could pick up somewhere in the night. My analysts, Anthony Molino. He's a poet. He lives in Italy and like a garden, guardian spirit with me. In Tazaki Shange, October 9th, 1997, Houston, Texas. How's everybody? Very good. Wasn't that beautiful? I think she would have loved this. And um, I'm going to sort of initiate some discussion between us. I, I, I had this um, uh, conversation a few days ago, though, that I wanted to reference where someone asked me, 
you know, how did you come up with the idea of this project? And I said, well, I, I didn't come up with the idea. I was mm. approached, and what I was thinking is, I, I, I didn't quite have the right language because I didn't mean, you know, I was approached and so then <laughs> I agreed to do it. I meant I would not have had the courage to undertake um, this project on my own, courage or maybe even, um, uh, I would not have felt uh, necessarily capable of it. Um, she was so prolific, so extraordinary, and I have spent so much of my life reading Shange's work over and over and mm -hmm. over again. And I thought about, as I was listening to just these extraordinary voices, chorus of voices, about um, part of what she modeled was courage. Mm -hmm. beautifully um, demonstrated by the piece that you just read, but, but also the kind of artistic and intellectual courage, right, to be boundless in terms of her imagination of what she could create. And so I guess I wanted to, to start with this question about if, um, to what extent, one, if there, if there are, if there's anything that has surprised you um, or transformed your experience of being in relationship with this, this um, artist who's shaped so much of us, but also, I guess, how her work has moved in your life as you fashion what it means to be artists, intellectuals, mm -hmm. researchers, all of the above, right? Because so often, I think in particular with black women, you get cast as one or the other, oh, right? Mm -hmm. But we're all, almost always, and certainly y'all are all of the above. And certainly you. I try. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please. Oh, no, no. I insist. <laughs> we just spent the weekend together, so. <laughs> okay, I mean, this is, um, this is a big question, Dr. Perry. <laughs> Imani. <laughs> Imani. <laughs> This is a big question. Um, uh, huh, how do I start this? So before I really understood the magnitude of um, Shange's work and what it would be in my life, the impact that her work and that her life and her service and her fierceness mm -hmm. All of it. Um, I was in, I was um, pushed to um, read for colored girls, and I didn't understand the language, and I didn't understand the why of it. I was young, mm -hmm. and someone gave it to me like a, you know, like a Tylenol, and said, "You need this <laughs> medicinal." Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it's really, this is a very challenging question because I've had close proximity with, um, with Shange's body of work. I've had proximity to her and students and acolytes of hers for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. And the thing that, the word that comes to mind is a haunting. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, you know, I was, I was kind of thinking, should I say this or not? But, you know, we are family. You know, there, there is a way in which haunting can uh, disrupt and clarify. It can take the veneer off of something. When you are haunted, you feel, when I am haunted, I feel something deep in my core, in my source spaces that won't allow me to lie to myself and even if that's the most comfortable thing to do. Hmm. It's the best teaching possible. This is before I ever met or had a conversation with this, this beam of light, this ancestor who is really present right now. Mm -hmm. um, and we have called her in by reading all of this work. And I just, it's, it's a lot to act like I don't feel that right now. So I'm just going to say that I do. Yeah. But haunting, you know, to tell the truth. Um, which is something that, that can be a challenge when the truth um, is uncomfortable, when the truth 
maybe put you in a position by yourself, mm -hmm. you know, which mm -hmm. that has done for me, when the truth reveals that, oh, you have to talk or say this thing or set this right, or why are you reading Sean Gay mm -hmm. or wanting to have this proximity mm -hmm. if you're not willing to do what the medicine has Required. brought and what it requires. So this has been my struggle, right? This has been my struggle, both wanting to have an impact in, in, in the world of poetry and and performance making, but also wondering mm. if I'm really about that life. Ooh. Am I about that life? Am I about that amount of vulnerability mm -hmm. to put that on Front Street? That's it. To put it in a write, to write it down somewhere and hope that someone finds it. Like there is, there is a terrifying truth telling that comes through Sean Gay's work and legacy that is still hard for many people to wrestle with to this day. Even though I love her, I wrestle with it. I wrestle with telling the truth. Yeah. So I'll say that for now. Oh man, thank you for setting the stage and always Amani with the most thoughtful questions. Okay. When you said, uh, you know, you can't read Shange and essentially stay the same mm -hmm. or act like you don't know better, mm -hmm. immediately I hear Tony K. Bambara saying, what are you pretending not to know today? Mm -hmm. And alongside her as a peer, <laughs> I hear Zaku saying, what are you pretending you know, don't know how to heal from today? Mm. Yeah. Because this is a writer who said and talked about her death frequently. Like if, if you are in the archives, if you are in the interviews the way I am, you've seen her talk about what she wants her legacy to be. And one of those quotes was, I will not die having left a generation of girls thinking anyone can tend to their you know, mental, emotional health except themselves. Right. And so that was her life, right? This is a person who gave their archives to Barnard while she was yet in the land of the living, mm -hmm. including her journals. I stay in the archives. So like, we're talking about family drama. We're talking about raising a child. We're talking about living in various places, parental expectations that you're bucking. We're talking about dating and heartbreak. All of that is in her journals. And while she was here, she said, I want you to know this. I want you to have this. And I'm talking about the journals because there is something very vulnerable and wild about sharing the most intimate chronicle of your life mm -hmm. with the world. And she did that for us. I encountered her work at the age of 15 um, at the DuSable Museum in Chicago, I was asked to be a part of this reading of For Colored Girls. And um, myself and one of my high school peers, uh, we split the role of Lady in Brown, mm -hmm. which at that time was my least favorite role <laughs> because I didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. And to have encountered Shange so young, in that particular role, the idea of singing a black girl song has been with me since I was 15 years old. And my life's work has been, what does that song sound like? What is this timbre? What is in the melodylessness of that song? And I'm sitting with that because I think in the ritual work that we do, so much lives in the body. And this is why, if you've ever worked with her, she will point out if you're doing something that's too academy, mm -hmm. because there is something in the black vernacular that is critical to understanding and being in her work. And so I think about the ritual of it. I think about what's in between the lines, and I can hear her 
asking me to be a wilder woman. Because we just left a weekend talking about what it meant to be wild, what it meant to be in the wilderness. And Zaki was a wild girl, like, wild. By, by all measures, okay? She was wild. And the, the risk one takes to be vulnerable, to write your life as a journey that is not always pretty or easy or what people think it is, the fact that she risked so much while she was here um, means so much to me. And I'm, I'm really thinking about the risk it takes to be free. I think both of you said something that um, implicitly as well as explicitly, but really I'm thinking about implicitly the, you know, there's something that she shared with Lorraine Hansberry, which is after the moment of extraordinary success, mm -hmm. the choice could be made, yeah. right, to fit, to sort of stay in that groove, mm -hmm. right, and follow the path of ascent. And this truth telling actually made the journey much more complicated, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but also much more fruitful, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, the, the character who for me, um, I, the one I carry is Indigo from Sasquatch. Yes. Indigo. Mm -hmm. I mean, she, I mean, and I, I um, and, to, and who, it was an example of her singing a black girl song, mm -hmm. the unusual, precocious, Right, um, imagine wildly imaginative yeah. type of you all are, um, and I, I do want to. We'll have a moment or two for audience questions, yeah. but are creators or the you talked about telling stories and work, but you but you're you're keepers of stories, yeah. you creators of stories, right? Um, is there something in the model of actually? Um, bucking the convention mm. of how you tell mm -hmm. black girl stories? Everything, yeah. Zaki teaches me everything. Um, I am, you know, of course, thinking about and interacting with, as we, we all have, the notion of a choreo poem. And so what I'm really striving to do is create new forms that are, that feel more indigenous mm -hmm. to myself as a black woman. Um, and I know Ebony's doing some of that work too and I'm really excited about it. Um, I'm also thinking about how to fix the tools to my needs, as she says in an essay in um, Lost in Language and Sound, uh, to be creating in a language that is a colonial language, right? Um, and trying to bend it, reimagine it, uh, as a descendant of people who were stolen, it's a big job, you know? And I'm thinking about how I can, for all intents and purposes, fuck up the English language yes. to where it becomes something completely different, as she did. Mm -hmm. She did. Um, I'm also thinking about and being pushed to move out of institutional spaces. Um, after For Color Girls was on Broadway, she said, I never fit in there. I didn't really like it there. I was actually pleased with, satisfied with doing my poems on bar tops in San Francisco. And there was something about being with the people in spaces where we don't think cultural production happens um, that I'm really invested in. And so, <laughs> yeah. And so when the work is too big for an institution, it's just right for the streets. And I am, um, I'm sitting with that and being challenged by Zaki's example of that and her return to that. And the transdisciplinary nature, not interdisciplinary, but creating something new after, you know, building on all of these various disciplines that we can build something new structurally, that we can build something new with language, and that we can build something new with the idea of what performance is and where it should happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so this is also a big question, <laughs> Lonnie. 
a life and death. Um, yes, yes. And we, <laughs> I want to I wanna say that we are all folks that um, we, the three of us are Southern folk. I want to just say that. I, I introduce myself by saying, you know, where my people are from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this has already, you know, this is important to, I think, lift up because yeah. storytelling is right. and, you know, myth making and world worlding mm -hmm. um, are strategies and tools and rituals and recipes of our folk. Yeah. And it belongs, these, these conversations and these stories belong there, you know, with the folk. And so when I am <clears throat> working on a piece, on a performance piece, I'm asking people to remember their great grandmothers. Mm -hmm. I'm asking people to remember what grew in the ground and places where their people are from. Mm -hmm. I'm asking them to speak from the source of the land and the water they are from. I am not asking them to put on. Yeah. And this is challenging in the world of making work that goes on stages or in spaces where people are very concerned with capitalist, mm -hmm. you know, return yeah. on their investment, yes. right? Which has made it challenging for folks who are doing that root work, R-O-O-T and R-O-U-T, mm -hmm. come on, come right? on, right? To be matriculating in spaces where our voices are asked to do something different from our great, great, great grands. Yeah. And so I think, you know, I know for me, it has been um, the most delicious approach to being a, a person who works with language and sound and movement and space um, to be in that deep, that deep practice of remembering. And I don't even have to buck the system or the language. I just have to remember mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what my people taught me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is more than enough to scare many people out of the room. <laughs> it does. Yeah. It's not because it's, it's messy, it's windy. I mean, the whole process, not just what it looks like when right. people come to see it, but the whole process upends whatever, whatever process many people think, mm -hmm. you know, we should be in in mm -hmm. order to to be doing work like the work that we do, you know? It doesn't sound the same way every time because the ritual of making, the ground it comes from, the water we are meditating with, yeah. determines everything. Yeah. And that is, I think, you know, something that is, I both learn from and, and, and I'm challenged by people who make work this way. I challenge myself, I'm like, wait, wait what am I doing? Mm -hmm. I can't even describe it because I'm not actually the genesis of it. Right, in a lineage. Mm. It's a lineage, and it is, um, it is an initiation. Mm -hmm. And every time it's time to make another piece, there is another level of initiating, yes. initiation needed. Yes. And that I mean in a spiritual way, but that I also mean intellectually. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's something that changes when you say, oh, I just came back from Alabama. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have to go to Africa Town mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and just be there in the hot Alabama sun to figure out what these people need to say in this piece. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I need to go back and I need to go back. And that way of deep listening also scares people. Yeah. Some, you know, in our world, they call it dramaturgy and ethnographic field research, <laughs> right? But we know go sit with your people. Right. Awesome. Go sit with your people, and that then shifts the whole model of making. And that, that's kind of, you know, that's, that's, why, that's how I determine where the work goes. Mm -hmm. Even if it go, has to go to a stage for a moment, it still got to go back to the right. country. Right. You know, for me, it's important that it goes where, the, where I found it. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, we can see it too. We can see it too. But what about the families? What about the land and the water and the right. air that made the piece? Yeah. We gotta go there, so yeah. I just love that, that Ebony is bringing up the collaborative um, necessity. Mm -hmm. And I think that we're in the lineage of that because all of Zaki's work was collaborative. Yeah. I mean, to the day that she ascended, she was working with musicians, with dancers, with other intellectuals, with other poets. 
it was all collaborative. And so um, the fact that we don't go alone, that mm -hmm. this kind yeah. of work cannot be made alone, mm -hmm. that is always spirit present, but then there are also earthly collaborators and um, elemental collaborators, I think is very key is very African, mm -hmm. and I, I think we're very much in it's that. It's very, very southern. Very southern. Very uh -huh. southern. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Uh, are it, is there a question that mm -hmm. we could end with? I love how everybody look at each other. <laughs> like, but I see a hand. Okay, because I can't see. I don't have my glasses. Yeah, on, yeah, so I can see. Somebody. Oh, I did get that microphone. Yes, come on, microphone. Um, good evening. Good evening. Um, Imani, I want to thank you so much for bringing Shange to us. Yes. Um, Ebony, Erica, thank you for bringing her life. Um, I just want to say this. I was home in my bed, and I was thinking when I was a little boy, my mother used to say, don't look at me that way, because without a black woman, not be a black man, mm. you know what I'm saying? So, and I say this because in the early 80s, mm -hmm. when I first came upon Shange, I was homeless, mm. and I was living in the street on St. Mark's Place, mm. and um, this playwright stopped me, mm. and he said, you like to need something to eat, right? And so he took me to get something to eat, and from there, long story short, I became Operations manager of a, of, a, of a theater company called Living the Dream, which is owned by a black man named James Chapman. Wow. He took a book for colored girls and he totally just read the book and made it into a uh, made it into a play called Our Young Black Men Are Dying, Nobody Seems to Care. It never went Broadway, it was off Broadway. What I'm trying to say is that from that book there, mm -hmm. it afforded me the opportunity get off the street mm -hmm. and wow. travel from the East Coast to the West Coast. Mm -hmm. The first black college I've ever been to was Howard University when he did the play there. Thank you so much. Wow. Mm -hmm. It just makes me it just makes me think about like what is the what is the impact of the playwright on the world beyond the stage. Yeah. You know, your life was changed because a playwright introduced, you know what I'm saying? Like, Absolutely. A, a playwrights are, are builders of worlds, really, and builders of new realities for yes. people. You can hear something that changes your life and then you move that way. And that's just, that's, that's happened multiple times in my encounters with Sean Gay and many transformative artists that are doing work that actually expands us yeah. and gives us, you know, more life to live. Thank you for sharing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I want to say, um, you talk about a spirit moving you. Mm -hmm. I sat at home today, amen, I could sit at home and still be able to pay my rent. I'm Come on a on, journey. Right that I didn't even think I wanted to be on. Mm -hmm. um, so look at this. My daughter is my uh, cultural ambassador, so to speak. Yes. She keeps me in the loop. Like, I live right around the block. This is the Schaumburg. Uh, I stop in here sometimes. I'm going to say my truth, because you said say your truth. <laughs> I might have been walking in the street coming from the grocery market. I got a cold Coors Light that got hot by the time I got by here. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm going to stop in. And I came in here one day, and I, I'm thinking a grad students and thing, huh? I'm a hip hop participant. Um, hip hop is a kind of culture that you are a participant because you are the, the culture, the thing they looking at. So right. I'm a long storyteller. I'm gonna make this so short because I'm very proud in this moment that a spirit moved me to come up here yeah. and to say a thing. I came into Schaumburg talking to them people, but <laughs> right now today, um, this, 
the spirit of this lady, Shang Ye. I do know that work about the color girls. I was young mm -hmm. when it came out and it somebody put it on TV, maybe Oprah did it or what have you. I did see it. Here's this though, the slave. Today on Labor Day, honor the African slave. Came unwillingly and stayed. Created in bondage to build a nation. The African slave with brains of might and creativity in abundance. Descendants of the African slave are truly the brave. Today on this celebratory Labor Day, I am no longer a slave, nor am I an honored American. African slave ladies become the feeders, nursing with love and sweet lullabies, creating the stream of enriching consciousness. And yes, I'm a big tit African slave lady descendant. Fill up on the milk with compassion, usually two at a time, only not today. Mm. Today, though, on this Labor Day, I'm writing poetry and resting my tits to be <laughs> continued. And now and I'm going to put on it that I came to the Schomburg and read in the spirit of Miss Shange. <laughs> This is what Shange does. You know, every time I come to the Schomburg, it becomes like open yeah. the porch. Yeah. 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 I just love that because there's not a lot of spaces in Harlem right. where we just can go and talk our talk. Right. And you don't yeah. have to be on the program. Right. Thank you for bringing an A selection. Do we have a B selection? <laughs> But real quick, I do want to say this is what engaging Shange's work and life does. That it is a conversation. That she compels you to say something, to feel something, to move something. Mm -hmm. And that is what is happening right now. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. Well, as we start to close out, if there are no other questions at the mic, I'm just going to say, oh, please. You will be our last question. I wasn't. Or B selection, I guess, okay, I'll, on I'll, the mixtape. I'll try to be brief. It's great to be here this evening. I wasn't going to say anything, but I was so inspired by our prior questions and our commenters. Those were testimony. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yes, they were. Yeah. And, and they were very powerful. I wasn't going to get up, and my daughter was like, please, mommy, sit down. <laughs> But I had to just get up. I really want to thank Dr. Perry for this powerful yes. work that she has done. I want to thank all of the readings and the panel was just prolific, prophetic, and brilliant. Yes, yes, all of them. And I have a, a short comment and a question. Everything that you all see here tonight, Dr. Perry brings to the classroom. My daughter yep, yep. is one of her students from Princeton University. <laughs> Adia, stand up. Stand up to the <laughs> She like, why are you put me up with? Okay, okay. I'm, but but I'm, I'm just yeah. well, I'm, I'm I just want to make a point. I don't see her. Huh? She's, she, she she's, she, she's, she's she's over there. She's not gonna stand up. She's okay. not. But I want to make a point. The, the brilliance of our sister. Shange, she taught us to be authentic in yeah. yeah. who we are, whether it's on the streets mm -hmm. or in the academy. Yes. Yeah. And what we do elevates the craft in ways that others just can't even keep up with. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, so yeah. tonight, that's what you all brought to us. You yeah. fed us fully. Mm -hmm. It was transformative. It was empowering. And now let's get to work. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I do want to just say, like, at Barnard, you can, you can visit Zaki's archives. For people who may not be familiar with that term, it's like collections of her writings, her journals, her pictures, uh, correspondences. And one of the things that is also there are her syllabi. Yes. So you can look at what, she, what and who she was teaching in the various classes that she was teaching from, you know, the north to south, because she taught all over the country. So. You can definitely go over there and see what she was teaching. Yeah.
take advantage of these archives that are available to you. Just wanted to point out that some of the images that you saw behind our readers are from our um, the Library of Performing Arts. They have a very robust theater collection where you can actually watch theater productions from the past. You can also see photographs of productions. Yeah. We also have, if you have the uh, little program that we shared with you, a selection of material that we have here at the Schomburg Center. It's listed by division of um, items that you may want to check out uh, at another time when you can sit with Ntosake's work. I want to say thank you so very much to each and every one of you. you. These are our world builders, and I love that. I love that, Ebony. I thank you all for being testifiers, congregants, or, or other ways that you might want to um, list yourselves. Again, if you were fed by today, I highly recommend getting the collection, which is available in the Schomburg shop. Uh, share it with a friend, share it with, that, with somebody who's not a friend who might become a friend as a result of reading, because sometimes reading is fundamental, right? Um, but I also want to thank our actor, actresses who were here on the stage. They did have to go, but please give them a round of applause. One of them has um, uh, an audition in the morning, and she's trying to prepare for that, so go ahead and send her all the best vibes in the yeah. world. And I just really thank you all for your care. Thank you for saying yes. I mean, I really, I couldn't have planned this. This is all anointed by Ntosake Shange. I want to say thank you to Bisa Williams, who is here. This is Ntosake's sister. And I know there are other friends and family in the audience. Please take this time to like say hello to a neighbor. And thank you for trusting the Schomburg Center with these kinds of conversations. Thank you. Have a very good night. As we leave out, I'm actually going to also ask you all to make your way to the lobby area for all conversations.